And now I'm in the world alone, upon the wide, wide sea. But why should I for others groan, when none will sigh for me? Perchance my dog will whine in vain, till fed by stranger hands. But long ere I come back again, he'd tear me where he stands. Dominic Sandbrook, anyone who has to leave behind pets when they go on holiday will be familiar with that sentiment. <laughs> the anxiety of coming back from your fortnight abroad to find that your dog wants to tear you to pieces. Uh, that was, in fact, Lord Byron um, writing uh, in the character of Child Harold um, about, yeah. well, let's call it a holiday, a, for a, a trip abroad that he made in 1809. And we'll come back to Byron. But we're looking at the theme of holidays because we're in the middle of August. Um, this is absolutely the holiday season. People are, are going abroad. They're braving you know, terrible flights, all that kind of stuff <laughs> to get abroad. And we thought it would be fun to look at the history of, of the holiday, of, of people going away, going on trips, having breaks. Um, and I guess in a sense, if we're looking at the, the kind of the prehistory of it, what Byron is doing, so he leaves England, he heads off for two years going around the Mediterranean. That's very much what aristocrats are doing throughout the late 17th through the 18th century, aren't they? So it's called the, the Grand Tour. And I know that you've been doing a lot of swatting on this. Would you say that the Grand Tour is the precursor of, of what we know today as holidays? Uh, yes, I probably would, actually, Tom. Um, hello, everybody. Um, yes, I think so. So we're going to talk later on in, in the week, aren't we, Or it's about Roman holidays, about their sort of antecedents to holidays. But I think, um, obviously, most people in human history never went on holiday. I mean, they were just working all the time, yeah. sort of tilling the fields or, or later on working in the factories or whatever they were doing. Um, so holidays are kind of connected with the idea of leisure. Um, and wealth. And, but they're also connected, aren't they, with the idea of self-improvement. So people, you know, what books are you going to read on holiday? Are you going to go swimming? Are you going to take up new sports? Are you going to see authentic local experiences? Are you going to broaden your mind by going to an art gallery? All these kinds of yeah. things. Sightseeing, exactly. I mean, these have always been part of the sort of the holiday ethic, I suppose. And um, Britain, I think, particularly has a – I mean, Britain is a pioneer of holidays, of, of sort of travel, because, of course, the British are tremendous travellers in the – 18th and 19th centuries, but also... Do you think that's because we're an island? Well, it's, I think it's partly that. And I think it's also the British abroad, because it's also slightly connected with empire and exploration and so on. But the British ab abroad is a perennially comic subject, isn't it? Because there's <laughs> yes. so much... We basically <laughs> travel with bags stuffed with prejudices, snobberies, yeah. normally about one another. Well, not exclusively. I mean, you know, also... No, about other people too, obviously. A lot of sneering about foreigners as well. Yeah, lots, Germans in particular, lots. I guess. Um, but yeah, I think it's a tremendous subject. There's lots of lots of fun to be had, and I think the Grand Tour is a great place to kick off because that's if anyone who's did you ever go interrailing, Tom, when you were a, a, a youngster? Yeah. yeah, where did you go? Italy <sighs> went pretty much Greece. everywhere. Yeah, I went to Italy. Yeah, Germany, France, Spain, everywhere. Well, there you go. I mean, that basically is the Grand Tour, isn't it? Because you set off from England. Um, you know, people who go interrailing or go backpacking now from all over the world, they go normally between the ages of about 18 and 25. Um, they go to broaden their minds to have fun. They go with the promise of kind of often the promise of sex is part of it. And, and those things are all true of the Grand Tour. And France and Italy, which were obviously the two countries that were most visited by British aristocrats going on the Grand Tour, I think that they're still kind of the epicenter of the global tourism business aren't they i think yeah. they're the most visited I think they are. spain I think as well they are the most visited francis and in spain yeah absolutely but in the 18th century why is it distinctively british aristocrats who are doing this is it is it because that they're, they're stuck on an island is it because the 18th century the british are kind of having a, a quantum leap in terms of wealth so are they just richer than everyone else um What's going on? There's, there's a really easy answer to that, Tom, which is that it isn't actually the British who are exclusively doing this. We, we often think it is ah. because it's the British who have actually written about this more than anybody else. But historians are starting to notice that actually there were tons of Germans, there were tons of Swedes, tons of Scandinavians going on these, um, on these sort of odysseys. But it's the British who seem to have been most 
I think because the British came back and they, they brought all the, as we'll discover, they brought all the art and the sculptures. They brought the aesthetic back with them. So they built their country houses in kind of Palladian styles. They picked up in, you know, in, in Florence or sort of Rome or whatever. Um, and the British just seem to have, they just, they just seem to have become much more fixated than anybody else. I think perhaps partly because of the island. Yeah, because we are, we were, and also because Britain was kind of defining itself against the continent in the 18th century, wasn't it? The age of kind of Linda Colley's Britain. So. Oh, well, I suppose, but there is also the idea of a kind of common European civilization, isn't there? I mean, for instance. Yeah, there is a common inheritance from the classical, classical inheritance. But also French. So you would usually go to Paris first, mug up on you French, would. because French was the English of the 18th century it was the lingua franca Every, you, know, you couldn't really get around that's right it. well let's should we should we let's dig back a bit to the origins of it so i mean as you will know far better than me tom people had been going to rome for centuries so alfred the gray went to rome didn't he yep. when he was a yep. didn't he go when he was a little boy um yep. so going to rome on these sort of pilgrimages i suppose well they're absolutely pilgrimages i mean that that is the thing they are yeah they have kind of religion absolutely at their heart <laughs> Yeah. People, people aren't doing that in the mid 16th century, are they? I mean, Henry VIII has no plans to go on a pilgrimage to Rome in 1540. Well, so obviously it's 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 a Catholic thing, as anyone yeah. who's read the Canterbury Tales will know. Um, it's a Catholic thing, but it provides lots and lots of scope for for fun along the way. So go along and you go on a pilgrimage. You're likely to hear all kinds of people telling you tales in rhyming couplets. Great fun. Great. Nice. <laughs> um, but with the Reformation, obviously that falls into abeyance, but it's interesting. So, so Milton goes on a, a foreign trip. He goes to Italy. He goes and sees Galileo. Um, he goes and sees the sites, but there's a kind of incredible sense of, of earnestness. I think about about that Milton yeah. is going because he his ambition is to become the English Virgil and so therefore he needs he feels he needs to have seen Italy before he can possibly hope to achieve that. Um at well, least I think that's, that's true. <laughs> that's what he'd tell his I, accountant. I think that's true of lots of the grand tourists, the original grand tourists, so the very early ones. So later on you get to the sex and the boardiness, and I'm sure we're gonna have lots of that to come because I know you've got loads of uh, boredomness up your sleeve, Tom. But the um, supposedly the first, as far as I can discover, the man who really sort of institutionalizes the Grand Tour is somebody called Thomas Howard, Earl of Arundel. So this is 1613, 1614. It's the reign so of- So he's a um, Catholic. Would that be- Yes. Would that be yes, significant? Yes, part of the Howard family. Exactly. I mean, it may be significant, actually. Yes, because he means he's not, he, he doesn't have sort of anti-Romish baggage. And he goes, he takes his wife, he takes his children, he goes all the way through Italy and he goes to Naples. He, and he goes with Inigo Jones, the great architect, the great sort of designer. Um, so Inigo Jones at that point is, is best known for his masks. I know you love a court mask, Tom. Love a court um, mask, yeah. So Inigo Jones goes as his guide. And that sort of idea that you go with a guide who's a tutor at the same time, who's more sort of plugged into the art and the architecture. Yeah, so it's like a kind of guest lecturer on a cruise. Precisely. That's exactly yeah. what it is. So Aaron Dahl goes and does this, and he and he comes back. He has tons of art. I mean, he's, he buys things by Leonardo and Raphael and stuff. He's really into this. Now, this is the 1610, so it's very early on to be doing all this. Yeah. But again, I mean, Dominic, this is also kind of setting a trend, isn't it? Because to this day, if you go abroad, you come back with, with tat. Uh, I mean, obviously, <laughs> Leonardo <laughs> isn't yeah. tat. But, um, you know, you'll come back with an Eiffel Tower, model of the Eiffel Tower or something or right. whatever. Exactly. Holidaying and collecting have always gone hand in yeah. hand. So obviously, that it, it, people don't do it during the Thirty Years' War so, or the English Civil Wars, <laughs> the British Civil Wars so much. I mean, there are obstacles. Uh, but after the end of the Thirty Years' War, 1648, and then the Restoration, 1660, it really starts up again. We have the first mention of the phrase, the Grand Tour. So that's in 1670. And again, actually, actually interestingly, going back to your point about Catholicism, it's by a Catholic priest who is abroad. Mm. He's an expatriate. He's called Richard Lassels. He writes a book called The Village of Italy. And he, and he calls this the Grand Tour and the name kind of catches on. And indeed in that book, you know, it's your point about the earnestness at the beginning. It doesn't sound much like holiday fun because Lassell says the point of being of travel, though he says there are four reasons to do it. They are intellectual, social, political, and ethical. 
Now, obviously, you st- you have all those things still today, don't you? Intellectual plus ça change. Ça. Yeah, plus ça change. I mean, he doesn't, the sort of paddle boarding and um, dancing in nightclubs do not feature in Lassels. Uh, but then after 1660, it becomes the thing. So you're, it's generally aristocrats, isn't it, who do it? You need a lot of money um, and you need connections. Yeah. You need, you need a kind of wherewithal. That's sort of what I always think of as that sort of James Bond ability to walk into the hotel and say, you know, your usual presidential suite. Yeah. My usual, your usual Mr. Yeah. Bond. Yeah. I mean, you basically, you need to be able to walk in and the, in full confidence that nobody will say we're fully booked. Well, there's that, that very, um, that very rather sad comment by Dr. Johnson, who of course was not a millord. And so therefore couldn't no. afford to go yeah. on a grand tour that a man who has not been in Italy is always conscious of an inferiority from his not That's having right. seen yes. what it is expected a man should see, which is, yeah. I guess, um, speaking for, you know, whole classes of people who would love to go to Italy, but for whom it's just, you know, kind of yeah. an impossible dream. Well, you have to be able to. So you have to have had some grounding in, you have to have had an education, a classical education, so Greek and Latin, because you need to know what you're going to see. You need to be able to afford the tutor. So the tutors were called um, bear leaders, or they're called chitorones. So that's Cicero, Tom. It's from, it's from the idea of, um, so the tutor is a sort of Ciceronian figure mm. who will Imagine that. talk to you about... <laughs> What could be more fun than going on holiday with Cicero? Because that's awful. It sounds absolutely awful. <laughs> no, it'd be great. Cicero is great wit. <laughs> Someone who would just talk to you about rhetoric. No, you wouldn't. All, all on your holiday. Um, but it's also the idea that it's an individual experience. It's, a, it's just like interrailing in this regard. Because basically at every stop, you're surrounded by other grand tourists. You know, there are particular hotels yeah. and taverns and it's just full of like my lord of bath yeah fancy meeting you here it's full of hooray henry's let us go out of the town (laughs) yeah do you want to go and look at some palladian architecture no i want to go and get hammered i think there's an (laughs) i think there's an awful amount of that i think that's yeah so basically do you want want me to tell you about the route should i tell you about the route which is yeah yeah tell me you set off you cross the channel you go to calais or la havre and then you go to um paris and there you are instructed in dancing, fencing, riding, all these kinds of things. So you're by French dancing masters. By French dancing masters. So you get a bit of polish. Then from there you go, this may surprise some people, you go to Switzerland. So Switzerland, which is not a great interrailing place today, it was a massive... It's too expensive, isn't it? It is too expensive, but it was not clearly in the 18th right. century. So you'd go to Geneva or you go to Lausanne. And the appeal of that is also because Switzerland, of course, is very Protestant. So the thinking was that this would sort of inoculate you against excessive Catholicism later on. So Gibbon, Edward Gibbon, the great historian, he was sent to Lausanne because of his papist t- tendencies when he was a young man. His his family thought he was becoming dangerously Romish, and so they forced him to go to Switzerland, where you know the sort of thin gruel and high peaks would encourage more sound views on religion. Mm-hmm. Um, so then from there, you go over the Alps. Now, obviously, going over the Alps to us is dead easy. To them is very difficult. So um, you, oh, by the way, you'll have bought a coach in Paris. So this is a bit yeah. like people going on road trips and buying a car and then selling yeah. it at the end. You'll have bought this carriage, and you'll also probably have a load of servants who will be carrying your stuff. So, But, but when you go over the Alps, don't the, don't the servants carry actually carry you physically? If you're lucky... They will dismantle the carriage and take its pieces and carry it over the Alps. But if you're if you're rich, really rich, the servants will carry you over the Alps as well. <laughs> so that's business class. That is that yeah. is business. Well, it's first class, I think. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. from there, you go to Turin, or you go to um, you go to Milan. Uh, you might go to Florence, and you're now looking at art. Do you go to Venice? You go to Venice a bit later, actually. You go to. So after Florence, you go to Padua, you go to Bologna, and you go to Venice. So Venice is obviously one of the great sort of destinations, one of the big high points. But the real high point is Rome. I mean, Rome is the place you are yeah. you are sort of setting out to see. And when you get to Rome, Rome is full of the infrastructure. You know, just like interrailing and backpacking, you rely on a tourist infrastructure. Rome has all the, you know, it has sort of taverns. It has hotels. It has painters who will paint picturesque scenes for you. It has entrepreneurs who will sell you tat. So who have huge ranges 
of sort yeah. of supposedly antique busts and stuff. Yeah. And there will be people who will act as middlemen and all that kind of thing. So, and then from there, you will go to Naples. And Naples, um, as you will know, Tom, you know, you'll get to see Herculaneum and Pompeii. So the excavations in Herculaneum started in 1738, in Pompeii in 1748. So, the, you know, you're basically seeing live archaeology. And you're, and if you're, if you're smart, you're carrying off loads. You're like grabbing the stuff and putting it into your, getting your servants to. You're elginning. Exactly. You're, yeah. You, that's exactly what you're doing. Um, but I'm right, aren't I, that Naples, I mean, Naples at this point is what, almost as large, I mean, m- maybe larger than London and Paris. I mean, it's. Yeah. It's about the third largest city in, in Europe. And a, a great kind of mecca in its own right. I mean, it's got opera houses, it's got its own court, it's tremendously fashionable yeah so naples has got everything so naples doesn't just have i mean it does have the opera house and it does have the sort of the pattern of cosmopolitanism and and sort of um high culture but it also has the picturesque so as you're getting later on in the 18th century and sort of romanticism is beginning to you're getting vesuvius aren't you to loom vesuvius yeah so there's a um a story about a woman called hester lynch piozzi she went to naples in 1789 and she said to her she pointed at vesuvius and she said to a friar is that the famous volcano and this friar said, yes, that is our mountain which throws up money for us by calling foreigners to see the extraordinary effects of so surprising a phenomenon. So obviously, you know, for the Italians, this is all great that all these people, yeah. all these sort of Prince Harry-ish figures are turning yeah. up with ton- being carried <laughs> by servants with yeah. tons of money. Um, but obviously, as well as the sort of – so I know you find the art stuff very potentially very boring, Tom, so I'll keep this to a minimum. I don't. I, no, I don't. I don't. But – Go on. So they bring back the aesthetic, so of kind of Palladianism, of neoclassical art and architecture. So they do all their country houses in this style. So Stourhead. You ever been to Stourhead? Yes, Stourhead, exactly. Or Stowe. Where they yeah. they drowned a village, um, put a lake over it, and built kind of classical temples all around it. It's fantastic. Yeah, it is good. If I was a mill lord, that's exactly what I would have done. I mean, Stowe House um, in, where is that? Uh, Buckinghamshire, I suppose. I mean, that is absolutely, you know, spectacular. Another National Trust House. Uh, again, done in this sort of Italianate neoclassical style, clearly informed by the Grand Tour with all the busts and the statues and, and so on. I and mean, these things are they, are, they are deliberate imitations of what people have seen abroad. I mean, often the things that they, they're stuffed with are liter- have literally been taken. So there's a bloke called Richard Boyle, third Earl of Burlington. He went on tours between 1714 and 1719. So these are often multi-year. You know, you don't just go there and back in a month. You could be away for two or three years. And he brings back, do you know how many crates of uh, marbles and paintings and vases he brings back with him? 40. 868. Okay, I didn't remotely get near that. That is a haul, isn't it? That really that is, is a haul. That is a very, very impressive and what did he do and with of course, it? Just kind of, did he... Maybe put it in his house. He had to kind of... <laughs> Or was his house big enough? Well, it must have been. Yeah. Or Do maybe. He had to build an annex. I, I would assume he had multiple, a townhouse and a country house, Tom. Yes, I guess. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would love to have gone on the Grand Tour. The one thing I would not have done, however, is to bring back the foreign fashions, which is something that we talked about in our podcast about yes. Anglo Italian relations for Euro yes, 2020. So the, the, macaronis. The, the, the macaronis, people with this sort of massive hair and with high heels. And so people bringing back. Um, Italianate or sort of yeah. Frenchified fashions. And they, as the century wears on, they get more and more grief from the kind of satirical prints and new sheets and things. <laughs> yeah. Because they're kind of increasingly yeah, steeplingly high wigs, don't they? And all that they do indeed. Um, can I just tell you my favourite guy who went on a grand tour is James Boswell. He's both a splendid fellow and a terrible fellow, isn't he, Boswell? <laughs> yes. Um <laughs> His his experience of the Grand Tour is is a magnificent one. So he's you know, he's the son of a Scottish laird. He's come down to London. Yeah. He's made friends with Doctor Johnson, uh, and he's going off on a, a kind of what will become a two year trip round Europe. And there's this kind of very moving description of him. Doctor Johnson has come down to to bid him farewell, and he sees Johnson standing on the pier, and then kind of rolling off with this kind of rolling gait, and um, off Boswell goes to the Netherlands, full of vows. You know, he's going to be good. He's going to be moral. He's going to be everything Johnson would want. And Im- immediately it's kind of woof, woof. He's straight up. Oh, he's, he, he's uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, he just can't keep it in. But he he keeps getting attacked by sort of, um, he's got to be improving. 
So he'll have yeah. a kind of week of, of going around all the brothels and then he'll say, no, I've got to stop this. I've got to improve myself. And so he is in Germany and he's in, he gets to Berlin and he thinks, do you know what I'd really like to do? And this is actually a, quite a theme of the Great Tour. You don't just want to go and see sites. You want to go and see famous people. Yes. And so Boswell thinks, I'm going to go and see the two most famous people in Europe, Rousseau and Voltaire. And so he also, from Germany, goes to Switzerland. So, you, you know, you were saying about how Switzerland is a, a regular stop off. And he goes to, uh, to Mottier, where near uh, Neuchâtel in Switzerland, where Rousseau yeah. is staying. And he writes this letter to Rousseau. I am a Scots gentleman of ancient family. Now you know my rank. I am 24 years old. Now you know my age. 16 months ago, I left Great Britain, a completely insular being. No, Did he have Liam Neeson's voice? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Knowing hardly a word of French, I have been in Holland and in Germany, but not yet in France. You will therefore excuse my handling of the language. I am traveling with a genuine desire to improve myself. I have come here in the hope of seeing you. So that's oh, exactly that's how good. he spoke, Dominic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he finishes off by, by, by saying, I have a presentiment that a truly noble friendship will be born today. And Rousseau is kind of notoriously grumpy, but he says, fine, come along. So Boswell goes along and he, he asks Rousseau, you know, they have a chat. Boswell's very personable, very interested, very interesting person. Rousseau gets on quite well with him. Um, Boswell ends up saying basically to Rousseau, will you become my mentor? Will you, I suppose, become, you know, will you become my bear leader? I can't think of two more different men. Yeah. And, and, and Rousseau basically says, no, I, I won't. Uh, I, I don't want to do this. And what's more, I, I'm in pain. I need a chamber pot. And so he rushes off to sit on the chamber pot. And Rousseau, instead of getting the message, follows him oh, and no. continues to kind of ask him questions about liberty and all this kind of stuff. Oh, God. I, and, 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 and Rousseau's last words to him is, be off. <laughs> so at this point, at this point, um, Boswell has got the message, and so he does go and he goes off to see Voltaire, who is is equally right. quite welcoming. Um, and again, they have a kind of long chat. Voltaire obviously finds Boswell hilarious, and and kind of <laughs> in the end tells him to bog off as well. So Boswell then goes off to Rome, does all the usual stuff, but then he goes to Corsica, which is in the middle of a kind of great romantic rebellion revolution. Um, and he hangs out with Pasquale Paoli, who is the great kind of romantic Corsican leader. And that's been suggested to him by Rousseau. And so he has, Boswell has a lovely time there kind of playing the romantic. And this, you know, yeah. again, this is an absolute theme that you know, we'll see it again with Byron, that you go off and you meet people in, you know, if you're, if you're kind of doing the extreme grand tour, you don't just want to stick to Rome or Naples. You want to go off to remote mountainous locations and meet exotic people with extraordinary facial hair, that kind of thing. <laughs> so Boswell then goes back through Europe and he has an affair with Rousseau's lover and housekeeper, Therese. That's poor, but, but maybe is that revenge for the way Rousseau treated him? No, not, no, not at all. I think, I think he, he'd, been, he'd been kind of, he'd, he clearly fancied Therese when he'd met her, when he'd yeah. been with, with Rousseau. And he'd been writing to, to Therese quite a lot. And Therese basically, I think, ends up feeling sorry for him. And they have an affair. And Boswell goes back home. Uh, he takes Therese with him. By this point, Rousseau is, is in London. And so he drops Therese off and never tells Rousseau that <laughs> he's cheated on him. Wow. Um, but the thing that I, I think really marks Boswell out as an archetype, and again, we'll yeah. see this in Byron, but we see it, you know, I speak for myself as someone who went to India on a, a year off, on a gap year, and came back kind of festooned in Indian fashion. Oh, I can't believe Boswell, you were. Boswell, you were such a parody <laughs> to go to India. A total parody. Well, Boswell comes yeah. back with a full Corsican outfit. Oh, you didn't do that. Which, of course, nobody else has. Please tell me you didn't do that. He is not dressing up as a macaroni. He's dressing up as a Corsican freedom fighter. Right. And so whenever there's a ball, he will turn up in this Corsican freedom fighter outfit. And to begin with, it cuts a tremendous dash. But after about three or four, people are starting to sneer. And so Boswell oh, gets the oh, message oh, and he packs it up and puts it to one side. That is very funny. Did you come back with Indian garb from your time in India? I'm not going to say. I can see from your expression. I think we should go to uh, a break here. 
Uh, we should do. We, but Tom, did you not go and did you not seek out famous people when you went travelling? No, I didn't do that. See, I did. My friend Simon and I sought out the um, the <laughs> the secretary of the Bulgarian Football Union, Boncho Todorov. Did you? When we were in Sofia, and we introduced ourselves. And how did that go? And how did that go? You know, go? it went absolutely brilliantly. We went to his office, and we said, "We're two young men." Did he speak English? Actually, I'm being very unfair because I'm leaving out Simon's girlfriend, who was also present. So there's actually three of us. But I mean, she, I don't think she had a great stake in meeting Boncho Todorov. He did speak a bit of English. Why did you have a great stake? Well, I'll explain. We said we're three, we're, we've come from, we've come all the way from England. Um, and, and this will not surprise listeners at all. We said we're from Oxford University in England and therefore very important. Um, yeah. could you give us free tickets? for Bulgaria's crucial World Cup qualifier against Russia at the National Stadium tomorrow. And unbelievably, he said yes. <laughs> and he did. Wow. Well, I suppose if you don't ask, you don't get, do you? <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, people talk about the, the entitlement of the Oxbridge educated. Was this just after the... This is 1990s. So I suppose kind of visiting Oxford students was still a novelty at that point. I think a bit of a novelty, yes. I didn't, I didn't then come back and dress as... A Bulgarian. A Bulgarian. Um, <laughs> from the 1990s. I mean, that, they were, that was a very shell-suited aesthetic then. <laughs> if I'd, if you could have done. I, I could have done. Bulgarian maybe, maybe, national maybe, team shell suit. Maybe, who knows, for our next Rest is History Club get-together, um, which you, could, of course, can be present at, dear listener, if you join the Rest is History Club, maybe I shall wear a Bulgarian shell suit. And, Tom, you can wear your Indian garb. Yeah. yeah, in national dress. Um, there's nothing more boring than people talking about the holiday, so I think we should probably at this point <laughs> We're going to be doing break. that all week. <laughs> <laughs> and when we come back, uh, let's have a look at what, you know, while the, while the millords are going off on their foreign trips, what is happening in Britain. Okay, jolly good. See you in a minute. If one could but go to Brighton... That um, is, as all readers of Jane Austen will recognise, is the uh, the exclamation given by both Lydia Bennett and her mother in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Um, Dominic, we have moved on from the 18th century to the Regency period. Um, and the Regency period, of course, is coterminous with the Napoleonic Wars. And the yeah. Napoleonic Wars make it difficult for millords or indeed anyone else to go on travels across the continent. And so Britain's upper classes, uh, upper middle classes have to gain a kind of vocational self-sufficiency. Uh, and Brighton obviously is, is one of those places. And I suppose the other one is another place beginning with B, Bath. So yeah. what's the story of how Bath and Brighton become the kind of honey, honey pots for Jane Austen style tourists? Well, I suppose you could say that Bath and Brighton are two of the world's first modern holiday destinations, couldn't you? So Bath is first, um, and, and they're both to do with doctors. So that's a really interesting. So health, the, the interweaving of health and holidays, the idea that you travel, you go on a break, you go for the, you know, now we think of as people will say, I need the sea air. You know, I need sunshine, I, need I crave holiday. sunshine, you know, all yeah. that sort of stuff. It'll, I'll feel refreshed. I'll come back a new man or new woman. That goes back to the sort of late 17th, early 18th century. And the, and the, one of the first people who, who really popularized this was a, a guy who was a doctor from Hampshire called his, he was from, it was, he was of Italian descent, actually. His family were called Guidotti, but he called himself Thomas Guidot. And he moved to Bath in 1668. So he's a doctor. And um, he publishes a series of sort of investigations into the waters of Bath. Because, of course, Bath, you know, it's hence spa. the name. So, it's yeah. a spa, and it's been a spa since Roman times. So um, he, his, his book, his most successful book is called A Discourse of Bath and the Hot Waters There. Also, some inquiries into the nature of the water of St. Vincent's Rock near Bristol. Published in 1676, and with its catchy title, it proves a tremendous yeah, Flying hit. off the shelves. And, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so people, um, people are generally, I suppose, it's the age of, you know, politeness, of civility, of gentility. Um, people are more interested in their health. Um, you know, you get all these sort of martyrs to their health in the 18th century. So people, and people are looking to escape, you know, booming, expanding, um, sort of increasingly polluted, indeed, increasingly industrial London. 
So they start going to Bath. Bath is rebuilt in Georgian style, gets the, the theater and he gets the pump room. And so by the middle of the, it's the circus, doesn't it? He gets the circus. Exactly. Do you know what the circus was modeled on? Is it the, it's been the subject of a podcast we've done quite recently. Golly. Stonehenge. Is it modeled on Stonehenge? Yeah. So the, the, the proportions are modeled on Stonehenge. And because the circus provides the model for the modern day British roundabout, you could say that the roundabout too is a, an homage to Stonehenge. Stonehenge. <laughs> anyway, I just throw that good. out. That, that's an, that's, if, if listeners have enjoyed that, please uh, direct your comments to Tom and not to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so anyway, Tom, if you had gone to, if you'd gone to Bath on holiday in, let's say the 1740s or 1750s, um, what would you have done first? What would your first thing have done when you, when your coach, your stagecoach arrived? In I Bath? would have taken snuff. Well, would what? But then, what would you do? Um, I would bow to the to the ladies. Not bad, but you should have gone to see Bo Nash. Of course, Bo Nash. Yes, because Bo Nash is the most important person. Yeah, tell me about Bo Nash. Remind me about Bo Nash. <laughs> so, Bo Nash is this uh, sort of self appointed. I mean, we should say it's not bone ash, is it? So it's not like a kind of a, a burnt bone. It's bow, <laughs> B-E-A-U. No, it's bow as in the French word, beautiful. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think he was christened bow. Uh, I think that's no. just a sort of, he's, he's a dandyish like sort Beau of Brummel. fellow. Like Bo Brummel. Uh, so he will meet you if you're a new arrival, and he will decide whether you're, you're suitable to join the sort of, the, the smart set who are called the company. And these are people who have kind of the bon ton. These, exactly. These are people who get to pre-book all the sort of tables and who get to um, I bone think I would. set you up with women to dance with at yeah. balls. Uh, these are people who get to go and join the card tables and sort of go walking with the right people and all of these kinds of things. And so Bo Nash is the sort of, he is the sort of the oyster. He is the social facilitator. He is the, you know, he sets people, he's a matchmaker. He sets people up. He brings people together. He's the pimp. He's the pimp. Really exactly. what you're saying. It, it's a very harsh way of describing. Um, yeah. And uh, so that, this is the sort of, yeah, it's the, so that's Bath. You know, you go there if you're basically, um, you, you've got to be pretty well off, I would say. You've got your aristocratic or your sort of very, very sort of high end of the kind of rising middle classes. Because you wouldn't want to go otherwise and be snubbed by Bo, by Bo Nash, would you? No, you absolutely That'd wouldn't. That would be awful. You get, off the, you get out of your coach and... <laughs> There's a lot of mid to late 18th century stuff satirizing Bath and saying it's, it's actually awful. And all the people in it are actually, you know, just ter- the most terrible people. And that, I mean, that is setting a trend that runs right the way through the history of, absolutely. of tourism and holidays, isn't it? Is that places that become very fashionable, immediately people turn against them. Who are uh, everybody hates see them. themselves yeah. as fashionable. So there's a there's a brilliant book by uh, Tobias Smollett called The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker, and there's a one of the characters in that is this really grumpy Welsh squire called Matthew Bramble, and it's an epistolary novel, so it's all letters, and he writes to one of his friends, and he says, "I'm not going to do a Welsh accent because my Welsh accent just turns into Indian." Um, <laughs> he says, "You must know, I find nothing but disappointment at Bath, which is so altered that I can scarcely believe it's the same place I frequented thirty years ago." I believe you will not deny that this place, which nature and providence seem to have intended as a resource from distemper and disquiet, is become the very centre of racket and dissipation. A national hospital it may be, but one would imagine that none but lunatics are admitted. And truly, I will give you leave to call me so if I stay much longer at Bath. So, you know, yeah, well, what people just say, it's a bad yeah. place. Now, the other places you mentioned, it was Brighton. Um, so Brighton, again, it's a doctor who sort of sets that up. So Brighton wasn't even called Brighton at the beginning of the 18th century. Do you know what it was called? Um, Brighton's Helm or something, isn't it? Brigham's Helm or something, something like that. Bright Helmstone, um, which I think yeah, is a much yeah. better name. So is, there was a doctor, a local doctor called Richard Russell, and he wrote it. And you thought that title was, was uh, catchy. Um, he wrote a dissertation called... <laughs> De Tabe Glandulari, in which he basically said it was about in, it was about your lymphatic glands and about how sea, seawater would sort them all out. Drinking seawater and, is, and immersing yourself in seawater. Is this actually medically the case? No. Or is he just making it up? <laughs> He's no, making it up. any listeners tempted to, um, <laughs> please do not follow and do not then, especially American listeners, do not sue us 
uh, because you have followed no. uh, seawater prescriptions. That would be a very, very bad idea. I want to absolutely, I want to distance myself from Dr. Russell's. But they go there and they um, drink seawater. Yeah, loads of doctors. So there's a guy called Dr. John Aswitter. There's a guy called Anthony Rellen, and they are, they're pumping out pamphlets and books saying, come here, get in the sea, have a swim, drink a little <laughs> seawater. You'll be as right as rain. <laughs> Is that because they, they genuinely, I suppose they do believe it or, is it because they've bought up a whole load of clinics and guest houses along the seafront? Well, Dr. Russell, so, who was the originator of the seawater business, he definitely he bought a plot of land <laughs> in Brighton. Did he? And um, he bought himself, a, he, bu he built um, the biggest house in Brighton where he could put his patients and their garden opened onto the beach. And of course, you know, you. Could, I, I mean, who knows? I don't know. I don't think we know enough about him to know whether this was him, you know, sensibly scam or uh, capitalizing on what he thought but, was best for people or whether is it, a, I, I don't think it is a scam from the beginning, actually. But I mean, to be I fair to too, him, we're being too cynical. To be fair to him and all these other quacks. I mean, there is a case, yeah. isn't there, for saying that, that they are onto something because presumably before this period, people aren't going, you know, people are not seeing the seaside as anything attractive, that it's no. kind of wild and dangerous and the haunt of smugglers and such like. Right, exactly. Um, and you yeah. wouldn't go anywhere near it. Uh, but in fact, people do find the sea restorative. I mean, that's why people go they to do indeed. and I mean, swimming. If there's any listeners, that. I mean, no doubt there are a lot of listeners who have been chuckling, as we have, at the idea of drinking seawater and, and all that stuff. But I mean, how many of our listeners enjoy wild swimming or think that going for a really bracing walk on the beach, you know, will it'll blow the cobwebs away? I mean, I say yeah. that to, have, have, you know, whenever we go for a walk on the beach and Yes, one of my my wife gets kind of glaring at me even before I say it. Cause she says, "You always say that when we go for a walk." I can beach. really imagine you stamping along a kind of shingle beach with your your dirty wig and a staff <laughs> and a frock yeah. coat, absolutely thing, shaking your stick at macaronis. <laughs> Would I drink a load of salty water? I mean, I just think I wouldn't be I able to. Like. I'd be sick. Um, well, anyway, yeah. this this turns Brighton into this um into this great sort of great destination. People go there to take to sort of drink water and get in the get in the sea yeah. now here's the thing dr russell the guy who you've accused of being a scam artist he dies in 1759 mm -hmm. and his huge house of drinking in too much seawater presumably <laughs> his salt <laughs> poisoning house is just, he's, he's he's made entirely of salt by the time of his death <laughs> um <laughs> he, lot's he, wife he's um yeah, they open him up and there's just seaweed inside. Anyway, listen, his house is let to big – because it's the biggest house. And do you know who rents his house? Prince Regent. The Duke of Cumberland, friend of Scotland. Oh, uh, butcher. Victor butcher of Culloden. Yeah. yeah. So the, the Duke of Cumberland um, inherits his house. And the future George IV goes to visit the Duke of Cumberland because the Duke of Cumberland is very kind of hard-drinking, fast-living, and enjoys playing cards and gambling as does the future Prince Regent. So there, the future George IV gets this absolute taste for Brighton. Um, later on, when he gets in, he's he's been told off for spending too much money and so on. This is about three or four years later. And I don't know if it's the government or his father or whoever has said, you know, you're leaving his dissipated life in London. And he says, oh, no, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll turn over a new leaf. I'm a new man. I will rent a farmhouse in the country. And he rents a farmhouse in Brighton, <laughs> next to Brighton, <laughs> so that he can just crack on with his old yeah. life yeah. in yeah. Brighton this time. He sets up an establishment for um, his mistress there. He obviously later on uh, commissions the Royal Pavilion in Brighton. The, the, the Royal Pavilion, for those who haven't seen it or heard of it, yeah. is this um, – it's, it's kind of Indian fantasy, isn't it, with – domes and yeah. cupolas and all kinds of things a, a, a kind sort of fantasy of conjured up from yeah. you know fantasy of india is that the kind of prototype for las vegas and disney world and the idea of that's a it's a good comparison extraordinary actually. buildings that that enable a destination to kind of in its own right become a tourist destination yeah i think yeah i think that's a really good comparison actually it hadn't occurred to me, the Las Vegas comparison, but that, I mean, that's exactly what people do in Las Vegas when they build reproductions. Of and it's all about gambling, isn't it, as well, Brighton? It is all about gambling. But going back to the first half of this episode, when people are building their country houses and they're building imitation Roman temples and things. Yeah. I mean, how different is that from Las Vegas? Not that. I mean, okay, they're not gambling, although they, they may be gambling privately. Um, 
But so Brighton does have critics. So the most famous critic is Jane Austen. Everyone thinks that Jane Austen hated Brighton, but actually she didn't. So you quoted Pride and Prejudice. Um, but she did go, I mean, she went swimming. She, um, she went, she used a sort of bathing machine. People had bathing machines because obviously people hadn't learned to swim. So the machine had sort of had steps and it was pulled by a donkey into the sea. And, um, so there was, there was somebody who worked on it called a dipper and the dipper mm. would help you in, sort of lower you into the water. And this is what happened to Jane Austen. I mean, that's a job that didn't exist 20 years before, I assume. No. Not so, at all. Yeah. I mean, so that's an example of tourism providing employment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would hire a dipper now. If I, I mean, I like swimming, <laughs> but I'd, it would give me enormous satisfaction to have a dipper. Anyway, Tom, I think you have a regency. You just as you had Boswell up your sleeve, I think you have another rake up your sleeve. Well, I've got you? Byron because yeah. we began with Byron. So, um, alert listeners um, will have noticed that uh, I, I mentioned how Byron went off on his tour in 1809. And they will be alert, presumably, as well to the fact that um, Battle of Waterloo isn't until 1815. So where was Byron going? Well, he, he goes with his friend John Cam Hobhouse um, and their unbelievably British ballet, William Fletcher, who is absolutely the embodiment of the, the Englishman abroad, suspicious of the food, doesn't speak a word of the language, all that kind of stuff. Um, so they, they go to places that are open to, to British millords, namely... Portugal, Malta, yeah. and then they kind of follow, you know, rather a, a bit like Boswell going to the mountainous reaches of Corsica, they go to Albania and they meet this guy called Ali Pasha, who uh, is a very glamorous figure. Um, kind of, he's, he's supposedly subject to the Sultan in Constantinople, but in fact, he's, you know, he's very much set up on his own, his own business. Um, he's a great one for the kind of exotic facial hair flamboyant costumes and in fact these kind of flamboyant costumes that ali pasha and his albanian henchmen are wearing um byron byron gets one so exactly as boswell had uh, had got a corsican outfit byron gets an albanian outfit uh, and when he comes back he has himself painted wearing it uh, and in a way this becomes the absolute archetype i think of um you know, the tourist going abroad, the backpacker, the guy on the gap year, whatever, going abroad, coming back with a ludicrous costume, wearing it. Uh, it's just that Byron was the, probably the first to do it and certainly the most stylish. And so, uh, you know, he's always got away with it. Anyway, from, so, so from Albania, Byron goes on to Greece, which, of course, is still under the Ottoman Empire, is very, very remote, although it absolutely part of, um, the, you know, the romantic imagination. Byron has studied Greek at school. It's, you know, images of the Parthenon and all that kind of stuff is absolutely in his, his mind's eye, but it's very, very wild. Um, and he goes on to Constantinople. He comes back and he writes this up as an unbelievable, you know, the archetype of the romantic poem. And Byron is describing uh, bandits in the hills of, of, uh, of Albania. He's describing uh, the Parthenon when there are, you know, the, Athens is just a scrubby little village. Um, he's describing the glories of, of, of Constantinople. And for a, a, a travel-starved British public, this is dynamite. You know, this is Michael Palin on acid <laughs> for them. They, they, they become obsessed, and it becomes the best-selling poem ever in English publishing, British publishing history. Really? By miles, by absolute miles. And Byron becomes a superstar. He wakes up, at, you know, I woke up and found myself famous, he famously said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but then in 1816, he has certain personal problems, namely that he has been committing adultery with his own half-sister. And this generates a great scandal. Byron goes abroad again. And as he sets off um, across the Channel, to, and now, of course, he can go to France because the Battle of Waterloo has been fought, he again will immortalize this in Child Harold. So he writes another canto of Child Harold. Still must I on, for I am as a weed flung from the rock on ocean's foam to sail, where e'er the surge may sweep, the tempest's breath prevail. And on he goes through down the Rhine to Switzerland, to Italy, to Venice, Florence, Rome. But of course, what he's doing now is much more conventional because he's yeah. taking the, the route of the Grand Tour. Um, 
And although he is kind of casting himself still as this doomed, lonely, romantic figure, the truth is that actually he's just putting into poetic form everything that uh, that the mid lords have been doing through the 18th century. But there is an added complication that makes it the reality of Byron's trip and, and, and provides a kind of context for Child Harold, you know, these last, these third and fourth cantos of Child Harold, that's almost pathetic, which is that by now, going abroad is not just for millords. So possibly the most famous passage in Child Harold is where Byron goes to Waterloo. You know, this place of skulls, the grave of France, he calls it. And he imagines the famous uh, ball held by the Duchess of Richmond on the eve of Waterloo, there was a sound of revelry by night and Belgium's capital had gathered then her beauty and her chivalry and bright. The lamps shone over fair women and brave men. But by this point, it's not just Byron who is going to Waterloo and writing kind of you know, beautiful poetry like that. You are getting basically <laughs> all kinds of people, mill owners, uh, prosperous lawyers, all kinds of riffraff that Byron wouldn't be seen dead with. <laughs> yeah. And that, Dominic, I think, is is ushering in a new age, isn't it? It's, it's, it is. It's an age of, of what will become kind of a mass tourism. And again, we talked about how the British invent with Brighton and, and, and with Bath so much that is, I suppose, um, a, a continuum running into the modern day, the modern tourist industry. But there's also a sense, I think, in which um, post-Waterloo, the Regency period going into the Victorian period, the British are also inventing so much that we would associate with, with the modern tourism industry. And so I think we should look at that next time, shouldn't we? We should continue this. We should make an entire series of it because, as usual, I think we absolutely should. Vastly <laughs> overrun. <laughs> we have. I think exactly that. I think next time we will look at um, the advent of mass tourism, so the, the shadow of Thomas Cook and Cook's tours of, of railways, of steamships, um, of resorts, not just in um, in Britain, not seaside resorts, but in Germany, in the United States. And then we will go on from that eventually into the 20th century and who knows beyond. So we'll see you then. Goodbye. Bye-bye.